Good morning, Chris. How are you doing today? I'm very well. How are you? What a great time to be a journalist, huh? Wow. It's like every day is a news story. It's it, it just keeps happening. It just keeps happening. How do you keep it together? Because I, I, I've always struggled with change. And, and it's like I had a general manager once tell me in radio, dude, if you can't ac- accept change, you got to go to the door. I, I need you out of here. How do you deal with this, Chris? Well, I think historical perspective and context is really, really important. Um, human nature does not change. People are not different than they were 10,000 years ago. We are the same species. Mm -hmm. Uh, We communicate differently. We live differently in a lot of ways. But our nature remains the same, which is human beings are the absolute best. We're amazing, but we're also the worst, right? (laughs) We're also those, those same impulses. And when you read the Bible, or you read uh, the Greek myths, or you read the, the stories of uh, every ancient civilization, read Shakespeare. Yeah. It's not different. We're not different today than we were before. And every generation comes along and says, well, we have, we're at the end of history. Yeah, This is it. Everything is different now because we said it is, because we feel so different and superior and better than these people who came before us. But that's not true. Um, History just keeps happening. And one of the things that is easy for us to forget is that many times in American history, we have run this thing right up to the edge. Mm -hmm. We have been in very, very precarious circumstances before. And we are most certainly in a precarious circumstance again. We have pushed our Republican, small R Republican and small D Democratic institutions into a a constant stress test where we have impeachment after impeachment, where we have crisis after crisis and it becomes exhausting. But we if if we give in to the kind of thinking that says that we are at the end of history, it's dangerous in several ways. Number one is it invites us to tune out and say, "Ah, well, you know, uh, it's all over now and nothing matters. Um, Number two, it invites radicalism, right? It invites radical ways of thinking and being because the first thing that politicians want to do is to convince their supporters that this is the most important election. This is the crisis. Now is the absolute fulcrum point of history. And that creates a permission structure for behaving really poorly, yeah. right? You can yeah. lie, cheat, and steal. The, do you remember it was a long time ago now? In 2016, there was a meme going around, would you kill baby Hitler? Do mm. you remember that? I do. It was I a, do. It was a social media, it was a social media thing. Would you kill baby Hitler? And uh, it, it prompted some interesting sort of chin-stroking discussion about ethics and all of that stuff. But the the premise was um, it was invidious. It was insidious, which is that somehow you would know which baby was Hitler. Yeah. Um, that somehow you'd know, and then if you knew, wouldn't it be okay to do something wrong? Wouldn't it be okay to do a wrong thing in order to save the future? We don't know. We don't know. We are living. We the it was Soren Kierkegaard who said. Um, Life can only be understood uh, in hindsight, but it has to be yeah. lived. Go, it, it, life can only be understood in reverse, but it can only be lived going forward. And we just have to do the next right thing. We just have to try to make the best choices that we can and nudge things along a little bit. And part of what is breaking American politics is this sort of cataclysmic end of times thinking instead of what is correct, which is this is an extraordinarily blessed, wonderful time to be alive in the world. Yeah. You know, you bring up that meme about Hitler and and right away my my imagination was was taken to the current situation with the US Supreme Court with them cracking down on social media what is and what and what can't be uh, put up there. And so I I turned to someone like you guys at News Nation and I know that you are going to explain it to me and I can jump out of the game of assuming. Well, um the the simplest way that I can explain these cases. So, uh Texas and Florida put forward laws that said that social media companies cannot take down certain posts. Right. Um, and the social media companies said, it's their, it's our platform. 
you can't you we have a right it's our property number one and we have a first amendment free speech right that you can't make us say things so these states said we're going to levy enormous fines against you if you do things that we don't want to do so the the uh, to be, uh, I tried to be skeptical and not cynical. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, the skeptical answer is that at the time that these laws were enacted, uh, Republicans particularly, Democrats had their uh, temper tantrum about social media in an earlier time. Uh, that the 2016 was their uh, their white hot anger about social media, but Republicans, uh, COVID really took them through to the stratosphere in their anger about social media. And these laws, both passed by uh, states with very ambitious governors, were a, I would say, ill-conceived and poorly executed uh, way to say to voters, we are beating up on the bad people. We're going to beat up on the bad people. Uh, And I think as you heard in the arguments at the Supreme Court, the um, justices, left and right, were very skeptical, mm-hmm. right, about, okay, wait a minute. How are you, how do you get to tell Twitter? How do you get to tell Facebook? How do you get to tell people what they can and cannot have on their website? And the closest thing to an explanation for it is well, we should treat these platforms as common carriers. We should treat them like we treat the electric company and the water company, which is that they're not allowed to discriminate. But of course, social media companies have to discriminate because you know what would happen if they didn't discriminate? If they said, okay, yeah, anybody can put anything they want up. It would immediately become an unusable space flooded with pornography and garbage. It would would immediately be useless. Mm -hmm. And the, the hard part for Americans to live with is holding these ideas in tension, right? Free speech is good. We like free speech. We like to be able to express ourselves. We like to be able to criticize people in power. We like to be able to say, speak our minds. But it's yucky too, right? Free speech is also yucky. uh, And it creates these problems. And we have to hold those ideas in tension and look for the most salubrious, the best outcome from them. As the leader of the Hill Sunday um, on on News Nation, how do you, in your own way, get people to those polls? I mean, I, it, it's it, because they're they're not reading the the stuff that's coming in the mailbox. They're they're not even listening to uh, real local radio anymore because I mean they're, they're so lopsided. So, but you're that face, that image that we're trusting on television. How how do you how do you send that message out? I don't care who you're voting for, just vote. Well, can I be? awful and just say like voting is overrated oh Uh, yeah (laughs) (laughs) i love that (laughs) Uh, um so look uh voting is a privilege uh that most people uh, around the world uh, many around the world do not have and and most in human history have not enjoyed right uh and it is the the franchise is, is is very special and sacred and important but we should also remember high periods of high political engagement are unhappy periods, right? So when we look back at history and we see the times when voter turnout was the lowest, it tends to correlate to peaceful, happy, prosperous eras. Mm. Uh, there's, a, there's a strong correlation between low voter turnout and positive outcomes for the country. Um, they don't cause the positive outcomes for the country. And in fact, voter apathy may lead us into problems uh, that cause bad times that lead to more voter turnout. So it's not voting won't make things better, but we should remember there's a good and healthy amount of, of, of engagement politically. And then there's an unhealthy amount. And we have had a really unhealthy amount of political engagement. Yeah. Being at News Nation, it, are you a student every day? Because you, you've got to be up to date with everything and new things coming in at all times. Well, I mean, the the goal on Sunday mm-hmm. is to uh, give a little perspective and context. Um, we don't have to do. There's one of the uh, many advantages of being on on Sunday morning. There's not a lot of breaking news, right? You're not uh, juggling the uh, here they come, there they go. You are hopefully uh, in a moment of the week 
where you can take a breath, pour yourself a cup of coffee or a chai latte or whatever your whatever your preferred uh, morning beverage is, <laughs> and take a breath, right? And let's let's break this down. Let's talk about this in a constructive way. Let's have a little perspective. Um, which, as you as you began, the the speed of the news cycle and the the head turning volume of news is exhausting. It's just exhausting. And uh, the Hill Sunday is supposed to be not exhausting. It's supposed to be refreshing. Yeah. It's supposed yeah. to be a, a calm space to have worthwhile conversations, not to stoke uh, fear, rage, anger, uh, upset, anxiety. Wow, you just described my household in 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 the way nah. it, because I mean that's exactly what I want on a Sunday. I want to be able to sit down, do my journaling, have have it on in the background, and if I have a question, I can I can sit there and talk to my wife. I mean, you definitely present that stage. Well, I mean, <laughs> I I am but a simple country pundit, uh, and. Um, all, all I have um, is experience, yeah. right? The only, th the only thing I, I have to offer really is experience. Um, I've been working as a journalist full time uh, since 1998, and I've worked at the local level, and I've worked at the national level, and I've worked in print, and I've worked in digital, and I've worked in television, uh, and I have had an abiding passion and interest in politics. Uh, and most people hate it. I love it. I'm fascinated by it. Um, I'm fascinated by it as a window into human nature, human psychology, social psychology, but most importantly, into the country I love. Yeah. And you cannot love America if you do not love Americans. That's the problem. Yeah. People say they love America, but it's full of Americans. I checked. There are 330 million of us, <laughs> and we are a real pain, right? We are, we are difficult. We are bumptious. We are factional we are greedy we are grasping but we are also the best right we are also wonderful and capable of extraordinary bravery extraordinary kindness and decency and goodness um and i i guess for me politics is a, a window into what americans really think and what americans really do right. and i can only bring that Wow. You know, you, you, you talk about uh, being proud of being an American. You're absolutely right, because my, my favorite thing to do is to sit back and watch people, watch the Americans, watch those that did cross the line. But I don't judge them. And the thing is, is that we, we are in a, a place of change right now. And something like News Nation is what helps us understand that journey moving forward, because you're right. We have to move forward while understanding how we even got into this position. Yeah, I mean, it's um, you know how you eat an elephant. No. <laughs> How do you do that? One bite at a time. That's it. One bite at a time. <laughs> That's it. There's no shortcut. There's no fast forward button on life. You just have to do your best. You have to, you, you can't do everything right, but you can do the next right thing, right? Yeah. You don't know who baby Hitler is. So you just have to try to love all the babies, right? You, you can't, uh, you can't know. So you just have to, uh, Davy Crockett uh, very famously said, I make sure I'm right, and then I set out. Yeah, right. So that's all we can do. We do we do our best, and and that requires, frankly, as journalists, a lot of humility. Right. You have to be humble. You have to op be open to the possibility that you might be wrong. And if you're open to the possibility that you might be wrong, then you should check your work carefully. You should make sure that the things that you're saying are true to the best that you can know, uh, and that your analysis is as fair as you can make it. But very importantly, when you're talking to other people, to be open to the possibility that they might be right. And if that's true, then I should listen. Yep. I shouldn't talk. I should listen. Yeah. I call that the silent watcher or the silent wolf in the way that there are times that we're not supposed to be speaking. But but being a member of, of that journalist, that, that journalist lifestyle, there are so many people that, that, that are just attacking you guys endlessly because they say you're the propaganda starter. And it's like, no, look at the real story here. Well, <laughs> well, um, <laughs> speaking of ideas and tension, uh, look, uh, uh, the we in the news media, I wrote a piece for the dispatch uh, uh, that came out um, uh, and examining what happened with social media, traditional media and politics in the past nine years. And it's very clear 
that social media was a, uh, a an intensifier of many of the worst aspects of journalism, wow. right? Um, because we followed the herd mm -hmm. instead of reporting what we saw. Instead of reporting on real life, we got sucked into a social media vortex. Because uh, I was talking to a group of students uh, last night, and I got a great phrase uh, that uh, this woman said, uh, journalists uh, misunderstood the difference between intensity and density. Oh, wow. Um, that we saw wild, hot stuff happening online. And did you see this? And did you see that? And it was retweeted a billion times and blah, 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 blah. And of course, among the most addicted early users of social media were journalists. We loved it. It was like a Slack channel for all of the news media. Mm -hmm. Breaking news and you can see it. And wow, this is amazing. And we were totally into it. And you know who else was totally into it? Lunatics. Yeah. <laughs> Lunatics were totally into it. Yep. People who previously would have had to photocopy their uh, their manifestos and hand them out on the street or write letters to the editor or bore people at the bar or annoy their families. Those people or call into radio shows. Uh, those those yep. people yep. Um, had a new platform and the distribution of social media users was not smooth it was lumpy and so at one end you had this huge cluster of elites in the media in business in the elite world and at the other end you had crazy people right you had a lot of crazy people with obsessive ideas and we got the tell us both ends of that lumpy distribution became obsessed with the other one yep and instead of seeing americans as they really were a lot of people in my business got obsessed with the craziest, most radical voices. My only point in all of that is, we in the news business cannot pretend like it happened to us because it happened through us. Oh, wow. We were the platform for the platform and we got Twitter brain too. And after nine years of really rough sledding, right? Uh, two close elections, a pandemic, social unrest. We we have been through political violence. We have been through all of that. Mm -hmm. And I pray to God that at the at the other end of this, that we are grown up enough now as citizens, but also as journalists, to take a breath and take stock of who we are. And, and by the way, what we owe. As journalists, we owe our audience, right? Mm -hmm. um, because they're giving us their time. We owe them. But we owe the country. We owe not to not to make it grandiose, but there is no American journalism without Americanism, and a journalism that does not serve the the idea of America is no kind of journalism at all. Wow, I love where your heart is, Chris. You got to come back to this show any time in the future. The door is always going to be open for you. I dig it. Excellent, dude. Will you be brilliant today? Okay. We'll try our best. Make it till you make it. Yeah, that's right. Thank you, guy. <laughs>